Oh, good stuff. Wow. In lieu of a sermon, I'm just going to do some show tunes today, <laughs> which I think will be pretty awesome. But I want you to see this amazing drone. I know, right? That's what I did. I'm like, oh. If you can't see it back there, it's a boat. And the reason for it is that we had a boat, which is really good. And then the, the, also Noah had a boat, side note, if, just biblically speaking. And uh, I thought, this is just such a fantastic way of celebrating uh, the promise and God's goodness that was, that was given to me this morning. And so I'm so thankful for that. We're going to be in uh, the book of Hebrews this morning. Before we get into this little spot, we're going to be looking at t- two verses you're probably familiar with that um, I think are, are fantastic. And the Lord just kept leading me back to this portion for us this morning. Kind of hard to say, okay, so Lord, what sort of a post flood, apocalyptic message that could, you know, you're seeking the Lord in that, and you're like, well, I'm not sure what to say. Um, but here's, here's, God gave me an image in my head. And um, the image in my head is one that is a super blessed image, and it's um, when our babies were little, and uh, both w- with my daughter and then my son when they were little, and they'd have uh, baths, and many of you are at that age where the kids are having baths, and crazy stuff happens in the bath, and you got ducks, and you got boats, and you got things, and stuff's happening, and there's soap, and there's all kinds of chaos that goes on when you're giving little ones uh, a bath. Um, but one of my favorite parts of the bath time was when you'd take those little scrawny bodies out of the water, <laughs> boom, pop them on the ground, and then just wrap them in a giant towel, and, <laughs> and you just squirrel them up in the towel. And then all of a sudden, they go from being completely soaked, completely drenched, soap everywhere, in their eyes, all over the place, to then these these fuzzy-headed little creatures that have been renewed. Let's close in prayer. Father. (laughs) And that image came to me. I'm like, well, Lord, that's such a funny funny image, and it's such a sweet image, and makes my heart feel so, so full of life. And I thought, you know, Lord, that's exactly what you want to do to us at this season in our life as a church, is you long to pull us up out of that baptism. You long to wrap your arms around us and just scruff us up and get us bright and shiny and all at the end. And so that's what I really believe the Lord's gonna do through this season. It's a blessing to be in this house and this house is one that has a heritage for us of many, many years. And in fact, is is there anyone that was here uh, back in the days? Oh, look at all those guys. Remember how fun it was every, I mean, every Sunday coming in here and building stuff up. And we did it for almost three years in this building. And were there any here that were at the flood, the first flood? And I'm talking about Noah's. Some of you are old enough to be at Noah's flood. (laughs) Uh, In 95, uh, slightly different circumstances. The building wasn't finished yet, wasn't built out, and so, you know, we just lost junk that, <laughs> that left. But, but this time, uh, qu- quite, a, quite a unique experience, and uh, Z- Pastor Zach did such a great job of giving thanks. The, the reality is, is the thanks goes down to every last hand and heart that has shown up to love, and it has been an overwhelmingly beautiful thing. I want to invite you to, to a couple things. First, don't, don't miss our Sundays during this time. Um, because of the normal flow of church activity is different. This gives you and me an opportunity to press into the heart of God in our Bible reading. It causes us to press into each other's homes and have small groups together and encourage each other uh, in the word and to pray together. These things are, are beautiful time for that. But w- would, you, would you make this focus, the body of Christ in Santa Barbara, being so strong and so bright as we refresh the foundation. That, that, that's the idea behind it. It's not just like, oh my goodness, we have to stop everything because we're overwhelmed. That's not it. We didn't do it that way. We, we stopped everything so we could put our energy into saying, God, we believe you want a platform for us to transform our city and to, and to renew the hearts and minds of those who are lost. And so join us in this season. Be proactive in it and loving and coming alongside and praying for and, and connecting in, uh, in all the ways. So, so what, what's, what's beautiful is that the church, it's different than just belonging to a club. It's different than the YMCA or, or connecting to some, some cool group of people online or whatever it may be. The, the church is God's bride, and he loves us. And some may ask, well, did he just, is he punishing us for something? Your pastor's too much of a goofball, so here's a flood. <laughs> no! God loves you and me, and he loves his bride. And he only allows these things, he allows these things to come into our life that we might be frothed up, 
renewed, strengthened, that we could show our faith in the midst of it, that we could shine in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. He allows this renewing out of love and out of his goodness. And so I just want you to know that it is an, it's, an, it's an important entity in the world, the church. And so us gathering here is key. Us having one voice together is key. And uh, God longs for us to run this race in a beautiful, beautiful way. So let me read to you the portion of scripture we're gonna be in. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's a powerful, powerful portion of scripture. And and, and let's take a moment and just kind of walk through it. Um, Verse one says, therefore we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, therefore. You need to know anytime you come through the word, you get to a therefore, you should know what it's there for. And so since I'm picking up in the middle of Hebrew, uh, Hebrews, this uh, wonderful letter, focusing on the Jewish believers, really speaking powerfully into the life of of the church and those who know who God is, uh, he, during, during this whole letter, he brings out what's called, or what a lot of people call kind of the, the hall of the heroes of faith. And so the preceding verses are, are like a list of all of these amazing men and women that you and I know because we've been reading through our Bible and going through the abide. And as you get to one, you're like, what? I mean, what? Abraham did that. And oh my goodness, the faith that he had and Isaac and Jacob and what? The deal with Noah, all the stuff, right? And, and I'm, I'm not going chronologically, but all the stuff. And each one, he identifies this incredible work of faith for the church, for the believers. And so they're hearing it. In fact, look, we're going to look back just to one particular verse uh, in in chapter 11, just prior to this, verse 33 and 34. And and he's, he's basically giving the byproduct of this faith and what you've seen in their life. He says, who, speaking of, those are all the heroes and all the, all the fantastic people of faith. He says, who through faith, Subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Anybody? Daniel? Okay. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to the fight uh, of the enemies and and of the aliens. Just just this sort of little moment, and I, I chose this verse just to kind of go, you hear by God him saying, all of these of faith who've gone before you, this cloud of witness that have gone before you, look what faith accomplished. L- look at the, the clearing of the flood for Noah. Look at the dynamic power of God's hand in the midst of the lion's den for Daniel. Everywhere you go through it, he's saying, don't you see? Now he's talking to a church that has, uh, and, and people who are, are post the Messiah. The Messiah has come, He has showed himself, this is Jesus the Christ. He has been crucified and risen again and then the Holy Spirit has poured out upon the body of Christ. The church has been filled now with power. So it's interesting that here the author is saying, look back at those who had faith and strength before the Holy Spirit dwelled in them, before there was power released upon all mankind before the church was established and a sacrifice was given in Jesus, it's kind of a heavy deal. So when you're reading through it, he says, therefore, (laughs) you also. So he gives this credible witness, God's power and goodness, showing uh, his faith and the hope and the strength and the miracles through these faithful men and women through our our entire word. He reveals those and says, look, they're, they're of faith and they're a cloud of witness, you also. So the reminder is that you, you and I, one of the things that God calls us into is we're to be a witness. We're to take that faith that we have and lay it out before our God and say, I want to act on it. I want to live in it. I don't want to just talk about it. It's not a religious thing. See, if this becomes a club or it just becomes the, or my religious duty or my affiliation, oh my goodness, what has happened? My God loves me. He loves you. 
He gave his only begotten son for us. And in that sacrifice, right, he brings about an opportunity, not, not most importantly, eternal hope for, well, forever. <laughs> it's eternal hope forever and ever, you know. Anyway, it's funny. Not only this incredible hope of heaven, but, but that he's filled us now to make a difference here. He's loved us so much. So it's a personal witness. And, and really what's being asked for is he says, in light of these things who didn't have this hope, you now have much more before you, eternal hope and now the power of the Holy Spirit to work. He says, you also have this personal testimony, this response to grace. Look at Philippians chapter one, verse seven. And how, how we, do we have the scriptures for me up here? I think so. Oh, look at that. Amen. Isn't that epic? It's so, wow. Um, Philippians 1, verse 7. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, Paul writing this in prison, talk about a trial, talk about a brokenness. Not only do I have you in my heart and in my chains and in my sorrow, but in the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. That's you, it's me. So how we respond in the midst of trial is key because we have a hope, eternal hope, nothing can take it from you, Jesus. He gave it once you've received it and know it and confessed it. You've got eternal life. You've got the hope of heaven. Nothing can take it away. Now what are you doing with the response? How are we responding? How is it that we're bringing a cloud of witness presently into who we are? So this idea, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witness. The heroes of the faith the testimony prior to Christ. But then we've got this amazing present work from the moment of Christ to now. And so we see that through the heroes of uh, the, you know, the apostles and disciples and faithful men and women who walked in the power of God. But, but guys, that's up to today. And today there's an amazing cloud of witness that surrounds us even in this room. See, so, so God's hand is not just interested in the, the faithful uh, ones of the past, uh, but, but the present, and also to go before us for a future witness. Psalm 139, verse 5. The psalmist says, You've hedged me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. That's how interested God is in this whole process. So we, we celebrate all those who've come before. But I'll tell you what, the testimony of Calvary Chapel, this journey that has happened for us in this city, is a huge cloud of witness. And I asked people to raise their hand if they were here for when we were in this building, and that was an amazing journey that God took us through in those days. It just was absolutely mind-blowing, coming in here for three years straight, setting up church here in three different buildings we used for kids' ministry, and families had to go get their kids and come walking across the street and back and forth, and we did that for, for almost three years as we're getting ready to go into um, the building. In the meantime, we have a flood down there, and it goes three feet all through it while we're <laughs> working to get it ready. Just mind-blowing journey, and faithful, faithful men and women who were faithful with their tithes, their offering, their service, their talents, their heart, to love this community in powerful ways. And many of you are sitting in this room and affected my life. I got saved, redeemed, and healed, and brought through that journey. I was thinking about this testimony from Pebble Hill to Arlington and to where we are today, and you've got you know, Chuck Smith. Uh, you have an amazing work that came through for us. Um, um, who was the guy up at Pebble Hill? Give Allen. Yeah, thank you, baby. That was my wife, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That'd be so weird. I've been so super weird, but <laughs> wow. I thought I recognized the voice. I was like, okay, baby, honey. <laughs> Call me that hot voice in the front row. I don't know what's going on. I just can't see a soul. There, I, I can see you, baby. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. And then, you know, then you got Pastor Ricky, and you got Pastor David, you've got, you know, Laskins and Jorgensons and, and, and Browns, and I mean, I could just, you know, they all, look at you guys as a family. What an amazing work of God that's come out in a cloud of witness around us, and it's that cloud of witness that helped form my wife and I and our kids in our walk, because we look to you and we see in you a cloud of witness. You've received the grace, and we watch that play out in your marriage, and so it's helped us to then establish our marriage in, and with, with our kids. And so it is with the body, such a beautiful, powerful entity of witness today. And then what's so crazy is not only the history that brings us to this moment, but the, the witness that we're having right now. And so you heard as Pastor Zach 
was sharing all the thanks of what's gone on in the building. And, and listen, everyone was, you know, so, so many people were left out. I was thinking about that first response team that was there. And it was Sonny and Noah and, and Brett and Ed and Doug. And there was people down there. And I was on FaceTime at home, snug. I had a little fire going in the fireplace. <laughs> My car's too small to go down in there. I'm like, sure, sure I shouldn't come down there? Brett's like, no, don't come. Hold on. And then FaceTime, we see, wa start watching the water seep through the walls in the kid's air. And he's like, oh, this is not going to be good. <laughs> There's packing sandbags out there. Guys are on the, the, the you know, it just, it was, it was wild to watch that. But the first response, what an amazing response. And then that next morning, when the sun cleared and, I mean, well, the, the rain cleared and we did just showed up, just our, just our staff kind of showing up. And, and I think we had over 50 volunteers that first day. People, you just showed up because you're like, hey, our home's flooded. What are we going to do? It was, it was beautiful. That's a cloud of witness. It's having an effect. So what's crazy is that all around us, the churches around us in Santa Barbara have responded. And they've called me, and they have uh, reached out to pray for us. This morning, many of them have said, we're going to pray for you as a church as we gather. So we know that, well, that's just so cool. It's so cool. And then you got Pastor Reno up at South Coast, and he comes down with a whole team, and they, 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 do, they just cater lunch for the whole team one day. And then, uh, then he drops off a check, a big check, first one that we received basically for our, um, well, no, 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 we got, we got a fun little anonymous one before, and it was cute, but um, it's really amazing to think that God's family, it shouldn't be amazing, we're one family, we're a body, but to see our brothers and sisters in other churches come forward and say, hey, we're here, we're not only here with you physically, we're not only going to feed you, but we also want to give to this effort and see, see God do a great work. It's been, it's just truly an amazing witness now. You think about Pastor Ralphie and his whole business. He brought all his staff down to work. You think about Dana and Rick bringing their whole team of people down there. Many of you brought your, your, your employees and so on and so forth, and you just showed up. You brought family members from out of town, and you just showed up. Praise God. See, that's having a witness. And so here when we read this portion of Scripture, we see this great challenge. Listen, <laughs> therefore, right, in light of this amazing witness, uh, you also are a cloud of witness that's surrounding and making a difference in the world. 1 Thessalonians 1, chapter 1, verse 2, Paul encourages them, saying, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you all in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God the Father. Wow. He's, he's identifying in the church what we see here today, your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope, your standing, and this is why it's important that we gather in here. These next weeks we meet during the week, come down, because by the way, we're stopping and praying at any given moment. Some of you have just come by saying, look, I got other things going on in my life, we need to pray for it. In fact, I want to let you all know, last week we paused and we prayed for Matt Dawson. He got heart this week. What? What? I mean, he had a wonderful heart before, but he got a better beating one in his chest. So in fact, I want to stop right now and just, Lord God, I pray thanking you so much for your hand in Matt Dawson's life and his whole family's life. Would you just hold him? Now the dynamics of healing. Oh, Lord, your hand upon that organ. You touch him and bless him and keep them, the whole family strong in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I meant to say that earlier, but wow, it's, it's part of the cloud of witness, God moving and your faithfulness to pray. And so if you come down to the building, that's what you're going to find, is we're gonna, you're going to find the church wandering around um, and uh, it, it, me typically making some bizarre noise in the hallway, but it's, it's just come join us. There's also one that we're leaving. We're leaving a, an imprint of witness upon our neighbors and the community who's watching. What happens to Calvary Chapel? Do they just go, oh no, we all got flooded, it's just hopeless and not blah, blah, you know? They're kind of a pack of Eeyores, I think, down there at Calvary Chapel. No, that's not who we are, right? We just kind of, we come out of the tub going, whoa, whoa, look out. Here we come, city. And now we're right in the middle of the city again, just getting this opportunity to proclaim God's goodness, but th there's an effect happening to our neighbors and our city as they watch. What's so amazing is how our pastors, Pastor Terry and Pastor Brett, by the way, you, you never, you know, it's, you know good leadership when Brett is not mentioned because he's just fantastic, just leading and pressing, just awesome. He, he's, but, but, but they took teams into our neighbors' facilities who were distraught and broken by the fact that their places were flooded and they only had a couple employees. And they didn't have, so, so our people were in there fixing their spaces. 
And that's just, that's just the Lord, right? That's just loving your neighbors yourself in the midst of it. So here we see that he says, therefore, in light of this, you also, and it should be personal. So not just simply that what, what, what's taking place, but the effect we're having and the effect we're leaving on others. Then I would ask you this personally. How's this personal cloud of witness in your own home? How is it with your spouse and with your roommates and with your children? And God wants it to be something that is not just outwardly with the church or in, in word, but that there's a witness. It's important for my wife, wherever her beautiful face is there, you can start seeing you now, um, that, that she sees I love Jesus above all things, and then it gives her hope when I'm an idiot because she knows I'll go to Jesus. You know, it's just, it's just that how that works. And so if there's a witness in our home, we can walk through the things that come. First Peter says this. Peter says, uh, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, listen to this, church, this is great, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. May that be the truth of who we are together as the family of God here at Calvary Chapel and how we knit with one another. That as we walk through these things, we'd be found to the honor and praise of the Most High. That's, that's where our focus would be. So let's look at the last part of that first verse. He says, so in light of this, if we're gonna be a witness, uh, it, 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 having a witness, leaving a witness, and also a witness personally in our own homes, then this is what we must do. We've gotta lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. This is a very practical, personal work of faith. It's a laying aside that has to happen. We must do it. We get in trouble because I think we, we, we want to try to get away with what we're doing or in the hope that that's just fine and since I haven't said it out loud and no one knows it, it's fine. Um, but God wants us to be faithful to let go of those things that corrupt a good witness that corrupt our faithfulness to him. Doesn't mean that we're perfect, we're not. But we are walking in this grace day by day, so it means even when we make a mistake or we have a struggle, we have a God that says, look, I'm right here. Come on, froth you up, get the towel around your head, get you going, moving forward. I think sometimes we wish we could just hear God's audible voice, and if you have the Holy Spirit living in you and you're attuned to that, you do hear God's voice saying, just drop it, let go of that which is holding you back. Now, we had this crazy dog named Maya, and she was born for the wild. She was like part um, German shepherd, maybe. She was part dingo. I don't know what she was. It was like, she just had a look in her eye sometimes. She was so cute, fantastic family dog. Uh, she was big. And then out of nowhere, we made really, Debbie, I think one of the brightest and intelligent moves we did as a family. We got this tiny little Yorkshire Terrier. And if you felt sarcasm in what I said, you, you, you know that it's true. This little beast peed in our home for 14 years straight. <laughs> and we loved it dearly. It was cute. But she was such a stinky little stink. She was just a little tiny puppy when we got her. And, and <laughs> I remember standing in the kitchen, and there was just one sort of hallway and then, then the, the living room this way. And I, I heard Maya coming down the hall. Tick, 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 down the hall. And so I, I looked up, and as I looked up, she went by that passage, and in her mouth, she had lady. She's like, I'm taking this out back and burying it. <laughs> and I remember, I kind of double take, like, what is she? She got a toy in her mouth, but she just had picked the little thing up and went, this isn't working for me. I'm going to take it out of here. And was walking by, and I remember just going, drop it! Maya, drop it! You know, and of course, she, she just gently puts it down like... Ugh. <laughs> Probably should have let it, no, I'm just kidding. Um, that was horrible. <laughs> Pastor, so callous. I sat out in the back, you asked my wife, and cried like a baby when that little stinker went away. Anyways, so, so it just, you know, drop it, just let that go of it. And she let go of it. May we hear God's voice in this, lay it aside, cast it away, put it off, get rid of that which is holding you back. Listen to what, what, they, what Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 13. He says, brethren, I don't count uh, myself to have apprehend, but one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching on to those things which are up in the upward call of Christ. It's, so you see, this is one thing that we're to do. We're to lay off those things, put off those things, cast away those things that slow us down. I don't know what that is for you. I need to examine my heart and say, no, no, I want to walk in such a manner that will bless you, Lord. In Ephesians 4, verse 21, here again, a letter of Paul says, if indeed you've heard, you've heard him, Jesus, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's never a parent's desire to put a kid in the tub with all kinds of mud and all this stuff and that they'd pull them up and they'd still have a bunch of mud on them. That's not the goal of, of being washed and redeemed by the grace of God. God wants us to put off that old man and that old woman and walk new. Those of you that have had addictions, have been struggling with and have been set free from, it will be a daily thing that before the Lord and the rest of us as well, to put off those things of the past and to walk in the newness and the brightness of our king. Throw it off. It's a weight. It's a, it's a, it becomes a, literally like a physical weight. And that's what he's speaking of here when he says that. Lay aside every weight. And it, it, it literally means like poundage. Get rid of that which is wearing you down and, and remove it from you. Cast it away from you. First Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. You have to be purposeful and you're in charge of removing it. It's repentance. It's saying I used to be in this and no longer. I won't go there anymore. I'm going this way. I got new, I got, I got heaven ahead and I've got a witness to leave. The Lord longs that for us to have that, that kind of witness and have the weight thrown off. You, you know, sometimes you acquire it because of other people's stuff. And uh, I, I picked up my wife's purse the other day. I'm like, what do you have in this thing? I'm <laughs> dragging it over the thing. And she's, well, I have your phone and your keys and your, I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, thanks, babe. Thanks for carrying all my stuff around. Appreciate it. What is it that needs to be pulled out of your purse? What needs, to, what needs to be pulled out of your life and dropped at his feet? You know what that is. You know already. I don't even need to list it for you. You're just like, oh, I probably have to let this go. If, you, if you're thinking, I probably need to get rid of this, <laughs> yeah, that's between you and Jesus. You, you, you probably have to. And the sin which so easy, easily ensnares you. And so these things trip us up. If you carry that weight around, you can't run the race. You can't move forward well. If you're carrying around all of the garbage and hurt from early issues in your marriage and you're still holding on to those things because you haven't brought them together to Jesus, they will wear you out and, and, snag, and entangle you. And you'll keep going, well, one day she's going to get her, he's going to get her. And it's just, just barely moving along. You have to take it before the king, set it before him, cast your cares and your burdens before him, lay it aside so it doesn't entangle you. We want to ignore it. And here's what happens when you ignore sin. So we had, uh, we had an opportunity to change out our uh, countertops one time when we were living up in Colorado, and we'd been in that house for 15 years or something. I don't think I ever pulled the oven out from against the wall. I don't know if you've done this. <laughs> wow, that's a shocking experience. Uh, <laughs> and we're edging that thing out. <laughs> and also I look back, and I'm like, oh, the dog is back there. Like, you know, they just... Like, I wonder where we lost our third child. It just was unbelievable what was behind there. And so many of us are just tucking the appliance back in there, not wanting to look what's behind the fridge. It's time to pull it out, clean it out. And wasn't it, it was just such a fresh feeling of like, once we, once we hauled all that out, like, okay. So it is when you bring your burden to the Lord. So it is when you set it before your king and you say, God, wash me clean. Take, take this from me, God. And he says, I love you and I will. And so God is doing a beautiful work in us even through this trial of letting things be washed away. It's a wonderful pause that happens. And I want to say that our staff, you know, all of our pastors and leaders, listen, you all have fun. Just, just shut up, okay, for a second and stop crying. And <laughs> so... <clears throat> Y'all have done such an amazing job. And God's given us this season of our hands in the midst of mud. And he's going to do something supernatural with our team and with our leaders this year.
something uniquely powerful in this city. And uh, you're part of it. All of you are part of it. It's going to be something you, you, we're just going to be amazed. Now he says, so we can run this, in, this with endurance the race that's set before us. And you know this, if you are with us last week, I talked a little bit about Ephesians 2.10, and I, I love this part, for, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So we're his masterpiece. And then he says, here is a race. Here's your run. Here's the, here's the labor I have for you. Run in it. And some of us, it's, our, it's a spouse, it's a family member, it's a unique ministry to our neighbors. It's, it's something, you know, we all have this race that God wants us to be a cloud of witness in. And he wants you to walk in it. He wants me to walk in it. He's allowing us as the bride of Christ to walk through a flood together. <laughs> so cool what he's gonna do as we push it through it. We are the poema, we are that, that, that beautiful poem for the king and we wanna walk in it. Now, this is where the power to endure comes. Um, in verse two, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so I wanna, want you to see Isaiah 40, verse 31. He says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It, it's a powerful moment uh, as the prophet proclaims this. Those who wait on the Lord. Here in Hebrews, he says, listen, lay all those off, run the race, looking unto Jesus. The same similar principle. It's the idea of seeking after the one who's in charge of the journey, purposefully, waiting upon him. Psalm 25, verse four and five, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, lead me in truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and on you I'll wait all the day. So, you, you see, the posture is interesting. We want to get out there and start charging it and carrying all the stuff with us. He says, look it, lay it down and then look to me and I'll direct your steps. And guys, as a church, corporately, that's what we're doing. We're laying down the weight of the burden of the brokenness that's happened around us. We're laying down the busyness of the things that typically occupy all of our energy and time as we're serving in this community. And we're saying, we are going to wash, clean, establish as we wait for you, Lord Jesus, to reveal and to move us in the path for you. Now, the way he ends this is very powerful. He ends it, and I'll, I'll read all the way through it in verse two now of Hebrews. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He switches the attention now to what Jesus did. Who, speaking of our Messiah, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, be a witness. They've gone before you without Christ, and now you have Christ. Be a witness. Be having a witness, leaving a witness, and a personal witness. Lay off those things that are, that are holding you back, and remove them before your God, and wait on the one. Look unto Jesus, who gives us the model of endurance. He endured to the cross, for the joy that was set before him. And the joy, when we get to heaven, we're gonna understand at the highest possible level, but you and I are part of that joy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whomsoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You and I are that joy. And because he wants a relationship with you and he wants a relationship with me, he wants to wash away by that sacrifice on the cross all of your sins, all of the weight, he wants to renew you, pull you up out of the tub and scruff your head up and say, I love you, now move from me. And if this morning you are just in desperate need and longing for this fresh forgiveness and you're ready to repent and turn and lay aside that which has held you back, I wanna pray for you this morning specifically. And I'll ask you to pray along with me right where you are. The scriptures are interesting and powerful, and in them we have this great dynamic of sort of direction for us in this. And Paul would say this, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and then you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so I wanna give you an opportunity for a confession this morning. 
Meaning you will say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. Forgive me and make me your own. I, I want to walk in you. And as you pray that with me, as you pray before your God, know that it's more than just lip service. It's not entering some club. It's a divine work of the power of God to bring salvation for your soul. It's a big deal. It's the biggest deal. It's more important than any building or flood or whatever. This is you eternally. So if you're ready to pray with me, you pray right here, right now. Father God, this morning, I see that I have a weight of sin. And I'd ask God, as I lay it at your feet, forgive me, wash me clean, Lord Jesus. Wash behind my heart, all around my heart, and make me new, Lord God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, for I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me as we close with worship? And Lord, I want to continue to pray for us. As I paused for that moment of salvation, now I'm asking God that you take each one of those who prayed along with me and that they wouldn't keep it silent. It says that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. We believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And so if you are with me and you know and you believe that Jesus is your Lord, if you got saved years and years ago, I want you to proclaim it with your voice, Jesus is Lord. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. (laughs) Feels good, doesn't it? Just confessing who he is before the world. Lord God, now as we enter into worship, We set these burdens before you. And I know that there is suffering going on around us. It's not just about the flood in the building. There's homes that need your touch. There's people that need a blessing. And so meet us in this time of worship and in prayer. And we ask God that we could be a great cloud of witness. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, there's going to be prayer teams on the side. There'll be some up in front, uh, down the halls. Look for them. They've got badges on. Um, As we worship, if you'd like to step off and pray with someone, get going right away. Stay after. If you ask Christ in your life and you'd like to just talk with someone about it, we want to visit with you. Um, Church is going to be so fun to meet here for the next three weeks. I think so. Let's worship.